Hello, this is Ben, and today I want to talk about, I'm going to move the earth again, okay. I'm going to talk about favoritism in churches. So, first, let's look at a verse from the Bible, and obviously, if you're familiar with this, we'll look at uh, James chapter 2. So, this is what it says. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, I'm starting in verse 1, of course, don't show favoritism. This is an NIV translation. Suppose a man comes into your, me into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to, and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not they? Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are not they the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law, this is the key part right here, really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Okay, so we'll stop there. Now, I don't know what your experience is with people in ministry. Um, I'm lucky because uh, I don't get paid. And I, I like to do ministry, but I have an agreement between me and the Lord that I'm not going to be paid to do it. At least not directly for that. I don't think it's wrong for people to be paid. Don't get me wrong. But it's just a personal thing. It creates a lot of benefits for me. Um, for example, a lot... There's a growing trend of people who are in church who are, are atheists. I hate to say that. And that sounds like extreme. Like I'm pointing the finger. But like it, it, it really is a thing. Especially for pastors... Since 2005, you know, it's only been 10 years that the internet has really exploded and like people have said, you know, there's a lot of dumb things about being a religious person and so you've got a lot of people who are, they're, they're kind of, they're in the ministry and they can't get out financially. Their children are dependent on it and they don't really believe anymore. And so it's awkward for them. Um, and if that's you out there, you know I've got tons of videos on defending the existence of God and any questions you might have with that. But let's move on to this favoritism question because it also has to do with the money thing and in the ministry thing. Um, <clears throat> what I've seen is there's a tendency to say, as the minister, I'm, I have a moral duty, an obligation to pay special attention to someone who's really investing in this church. And, you know, especially in the case of, let's say, you're taking care of the, the, the youth or the children, and then if their parents are the ones who are really paying the money to fund the church, then it seems like you have a moral obligation or a moral duty to pay more attention to their children and that kind of thing and ignore children whose parents aren't you know investing in investing in the church is kind of a broad generic g vague term investing clearly it means something that they're actually putting money in the church they may be putting their time in the church who knows now this issue it does it does seem like it makes sense right like Let's say let's let's look at a different example. Um, let's because I mean that defense seems like it makes sense, but then if we would, it seems like the opposite of what James is saying. But it does seem good. Like yeah, if they're investing in the church, then I have an obligation as they're the ones who are paying my salary, and they're the ones who I, I should really try to encourage that or build that up or something. Okay, so um, let's say I'm I cut grass and I've got one customer over here. And I take care of her yard, and she's always trying to get out of paying me, but she's also all the time, you know, nagging me to do more, and then she, it's too much. And she takes up all my time, because she's always wanting something else. 
And then there's this other lady over here who uh, is very patient. She knows what she wants. She's happy when I do it. And she always pays me happily. Um, it doesn't, it's not fair to the lady who's paying me happily to make her have to wait longer to get her work because I'm too busy taking care of the other lady who's nagging me. It's not fair to her because she's she's doing what she's supposed to. She's paying me happily. She ought to get the preferential treatment at, because she's the one who's treating me better and she's the one, she should be treated like the customer who's treating me better and this other lady who doesn't want to pay me should be treated as though she doesn't want to pay me. So in other words, if you're paid well, you work well. If you're if people don't want to pay me at all, then I don't do any work for them. Okay, so it seems like I'm showing favoritism, right? And it seems like it, it, it it's analogous to ministry, but it's not. It's not analogous to ministry. And this is why, okay, what James says here, love your neighbor as yourself. Your ministry, and, th and th this is the weird thing about words. Words can become... We can say ministry is this magic word and we forget what that word means. And then in the ambiguity of that word, we can play all kinds of mental tricks and do gymnastics to get out of what we're supposed to do. Or get out of the real logical conclusions. What is ministry? Ministry is to love your neighbor as yourself. To, to care about other people's needs as though they were your needs. Okay? That's what ministry is. So, think about it. Let's say some really, really poor person comes to your church, and this person is a jerk, just expects you, they're always looking for you to do something for them, and they're always begging and needing this and that and the other, and they don't help out with anything, and they're always needing help with everything. Love that person like they were you. Now, if you were that person, you probably, what you would want is for to, to have your foot rubbed and get every little thing, right? But loving someone doesn't always mean doing what they want, does it? It means doing what's best for them. And that's where ministry's at. Jesus didn't always do what we asked him to do. He did what we really needed, what was really best for us, because he really loved us. And so, if a person's like that, then the best thing for them is, don't ignore them necessarily, but customize what you're, how you're ministering to that person. Minister to that attitude of selfishness. Find ways to, to help them cope with that. Okay? But don't ignore them. You've got a duty to love that person, and, and loving that person means showing them, the, you know, ministering to their spiritual needs. Let's say there's another person over here who's super wealthy and they donate a ton of money to church, but they also have a super entitled attitude and they think every, they're just like the poor person we talked about a minute ago, they think everything should revolve around them. What does that person need? Needs to be, what, what, if you really care about that person and you, you, you're going to treat them like they're as important as you are, you're going to go straight for their, their deepest spiritual need and their deepest spiritual need is to, to have their selfishness dealt with. Okay? Let's flip-flop it, and let's say you've got a really wealthy person who comes to the church and they're doing everything they should, and they're helping out, and you know they're donating money happily, not expecting anything in return. What's, what's the ministry to that person? Well, that person should be encouraged for what they're doing. And so for whatever person it is, the right ministry is really about where they're at spiritually. And treat them like they're you, and love them like they're you, and then do for them what you would want done for you if you were them, whoever they are. That's your obligation. Okay, so this obligation, because these people give me money, they get more of my attention. No, 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 no. If someone has a bad attitude, then you need to minister to that bad attitude. If they're not willing to give money, you need to minister to the fact that they, they need to help out and invest in the church. That's what you need to minister to. Whatever whatever issue their issue is, minister to that. If they're if they're ministering, if they're investing in church a whole lot, then encourage that and and let them know you know that you are grateful. And the church as a whole is grateful. Now, the problem is, and this is what I alluded to earlier, is 
there's definitely a tendency to be an atheist minister. And maybe you're not someone who, you know, thinks that there's no God, but we ignore God and we treat God like he's not there. And it becomes really dangerous in ministry because you start saying, well, my resources are limited and I can't pay attention to everyone. So I'm just going to give up on trying to be there for everyone. And I've got to cut corners because it's just me, right? Because if there's no God, then all of a sudden you as the minister are trying to meet the spiritual needs of people with just your abilities, okay? And that, that's not good. That's not good. Because you will start to cut corners morally, okay? Now, I understand you as an individual, you have limited time. But, what obviously makes the most sense is to say, how can I be part of what God is doing in this person's life? And where has God really blessed my attempts to help people? And just kind of go there. But don't think that just because you're not taking care of this person or taking care of that person, there's no God who isn't looking out for everyone. You're just here to be part of His masterwork, His master plan. Don't treat him like he's not there. Because if you do that in ministry, you start to cut corners out of desperation, out of fear. But when there's God in the picture, that drives out, that drives out the fear. And I hope that makes sense. Thank you for your time.